Well, my name is Peter Kachola Schmal. Yes, I'm in Germany and I'm talking about what the pandemic is doing to our cities. Civitas, the Latin word, has something to do with the body of citizens, our, with the origin of the word city, citizens, civilization. And our museum, the Deutsche Architektur Museum, the German Architecture Museum, is a very urban architecture museum in the middle of the city of Frankfurt. And how, how does this museum and our, how does our work cope with these pandemics? Yes. As you all know, um, uh, it COVID-19 hit Europe in the beginning of the year as it did Japan. And we had a lockdown in March. Um, these photos, as you can imagine, you see them from all the world and they're always the same. We are quite thrilled with empty highways, with people shopping weird things. And um, of course, since uh, football is our national pastime, we were developing a sort of way how to deal with playing football on TV without any visitors. But for us as a museum, to close the museum is very, very strange because this is what we're doing. We're showing 15 to 20 shows a year. We have maybe 100 architecture events a year. We have very big awards like the International High Rise Award at the end of October. Um, Europe was behaving very strangely. Uh, we closed our open borders between each other because suddenly this joint European community was not behaving jointly anymore. Everybody was behaving as an own country, like in the Middle Ages, and not trusting the neighbor. Everybody has different laws. And suddenly, there's new rules of how uh, borders are open and closed. Frankfurt Airport is using its runways to park the airplanes. Our national carrier, Lufthansa, has to be saved from bankruptcy. And um, as you all know, we all love to go to Venice every two years. And the, I was the head of the national jury for the German pavilion. The Venice Biennale 20 in May 20 did not happen. It was postponed on the left to the end of August. Then it was postponed again to May 21. And our team is coping very badly because when this decision was taken in March 5, as you can see, uh, they had all the material in Venice already and they were preparing for the pavilion. We are the neighbor of the Japanese pavilion and I can imagine the same thing happened to you. And now this team was preparing for August and now it's preparing for next May. This is very terrible. The budget has not improved. So we will see a very strange Biennale if it, if it opens in May 21. And what happened was all over the world, suddenly there was architecture streams online for free of charge. This is an, a European format called Architects Not Architecture, uh, which normally happens in big cities with four or 500 people watching. And uh, now you have all these films that they took and they were shown free of charge. And you could see at home, you can still go there today, you can see Richard Rogers and so on talking about their own personal life. So this is very difficult for a museum. What to do as an event when there's no money, when these kind of high class events are for free. What we did, we did not open our show in March. Um, we made two, three minute movies that we were trying to explain a certain piece of the exhibition, like a little bit of teaser so people could get what the exhibition could be about if it then opens. We were trying to get used to the new normal. And as you all know, these, these precautions, we opened in May um, after six weeks, seven weeks. And down there, you see one of the first concerts in June, um, very strangely listening to music in this type of way. Uh, we have quite a few awards, like, for example, the best German architecture. This is the jury 
of for the best German architecture of the year, with half of the jury sitting here with you. Um, as you can see, there's a certain distance from each other, and the half other half of the jury team is sitting online um, by Zoom, like now. Uh, a jury by Zoom is quite difficult, quite different. We had to learn, which means um, you don't want two days of jury on Zoom. So you have to prepare sort of a homework and this homework everybody got beforehand and every juror had to work themselves through all the projects and select their 20 best. And then we talk about everybody's selection to make it more efficient. Um, we had a very big press conference, as you see here in mid of July, um, with the Bundesbank, our national bank. And of course, we did this as a Zoom conference with everybody online, the press, and a few guests in our auditorium, as you can see. These things cost a lot of money. Um, we tried organized tours with face shields, which are now forbidden because they're deemed to be not secure anymore. We tried open air podium talks uh, with, uh, as you can see, citizens and the one with the blue shirt is our head of planning department. We tried Zoom award ceremonies, which were quite successful. This type of thing works and we will continue to do that. Um, the good part about the first lockdown when it eased up in May and in June, we had fantastic weather. We had a wonderful summer. The city itself was changed. As you can see here, one of the main roads downtown, the car parking is taken away and has been replaced by plants and more seating. So the restaurants could serve outside, which means people would love it to be outside. Nobody would sit inside, afraid of the aerosols. Um, many European cities changed and transformed in this way by pop-up green, by pop-up sitting outside, which is fine in July. Um, we built a lot of new roads, as you can see here for bicycles, reducing space for cars, which worked since many people were, most people were in home office, not such a lot of traffic, um, but this is all summer and the temperature is fine. There's more, everybody's on bike. This is okay, this is fine. Uh, the bad part is that all the clubs were closed and the young people were going out onto the major squares, meaning that the public open space was being discovered as the public open club. And this is the Alte Oper Square, the old opera. There were parties on the weekends that turned into three to 4,000 people parties that of course had nothing to do with distancing and so on. Police were helpless, overwhelmed, and they did not dare go in there. Everybody was drinking alcohol, they got rowdy. It, this party lasted till six in the morning. Usually um, it happened on all the major public spaces all over Germany, all over Europe. Um, of course, in summer, as you can see, uh, Arabic uh, marriages, um, we had huge weddings, huge family gatherings um, in courtyards, on squares, um, 300, 400 people weddings. And as you can imagine, this is a super spreader event, which we call this, uh, which was not helpful. So uh, after this very nice summer, the, the numbers in Europe exploded. As you can see on the left, this is 20 July to 2nd of August, very, very, very low numbers. And then every month, the chart is getting browner and this is the European Center of Disease Prevention. If you look very closely, you see that the colors and the left side, you have uh, only up to 120 for two week, 
two two week uh, case notifications. They had to expand that. They had to introduce new colors. So this uh, this is all something that nobody was prepared for, and especially German numbers exploded. This is the first of October, and this is yesterday. Uh, if you look on the left, you see the colors. They kept the colors, but they had to introduce. Um, the 100 to 200, 200, 350, 350 to 500, 500 to 1,000 cases in within the last seven days. We have these black places um, in Eastern Germany where there is more than 500 cases in every week per 100,000 people, which is a lot. Um, and we are sitting now in a very, very bad and deep shape uh, this was yesterday. Our chancellor had her first TV speech to our to the people, a very emotional speech which was broadcast live, um, telling everybody that this does not work. Our so-called second lockdown since sec first of November, with re uh, restaurants closed, museums closed again, but stores open and schools open does not work. We had 600 deaths almost yesterday, which is terrible. And we had, we have now more than 20,000 cases every day. So we will really lock down now, I suppose, from next week. And people are getting uneasy. We have a lot of protests going on, and they seem to turn um, even aggressive and violent. Uh, our politicians look at these charts, uh, for example, the one from Victoria, Australia or Israel, and everybody knows if you do a really tough lockdown, you can get the numbers down. But they don't dare because the public does not seem to be really liking it. This is a very difficult thing to do. As you all know, Australia was really being tough. You could not travel from one state to the other, and they brought the numbers down. Well, what is very new now for us is that everybody is looking at Asia. This is an English article, but we have these articles everywhere. So what went wrong in our European democracies, and what could we possibly learn from Asia? This is a question that is quite new um, because it's not about technology. Um, very interesting artic article in the Spanish paper called, uh, as you can see here, by the philosopher Byung Chul Han. He is a Korean philosopher that lives in Berlin. And he wrote in Spain this article. This is a part of it, as you can see, he is quoting your finance minister, Taro Aso, with the word Mindo. And he's trying to explain what that could possibly mean to European audience. And as you see, um, he's trying to tell people that in Japan, people follow these rules voluntarily. You do not need control and enforced measures. And he writes, it seems that we fail to show character. Western liberalism sh tries to be weak, possibly. And, um, and he's trying to explain that your communities maybe have more freedom because you follow these guidelines voluntarily. But um, as, you, as, as he goes on, he's talking that, about it, that um, we should talk about the us and not the collection of our egos. So his point is, uh, we should need more civility, more collective action and more responsibility. Very interesting. You see these type of Eastern thoughts that are being translated into our Western society. And I'm not sure if this will catch on with everybody, um, but as you can see, uh, Mr. Uh, Lord Norman Foster um, has been speaking to the United Nations and they asked him what will come out of this pandemic, what will planning learn, and he will say 
our cities will not change. There will be no total change, but there will be ch trends that will come more to the front and they will be accelerated. And as you can see here, these are the points that Mr. Foster is pointing out on the right. Um, these are the trends that will be more strong. So the buildings will have to be more healthy, more social, more sunny, more sustainable. Our food will have to be coming from nearby. Our trade will be more local and less global, which I'm not 100% sure if that's true, because things like our iPhone is not coming from a local production. The moving will be moving, meaning mobility, will have to be cleaner, faster, quieter, safer, electric possibly. On the left, work will be at home and at your workplace and at a third place. This is of course interesting because I'm sitting here at home. Um, this working from home will not mean that there's no more working from the office, but the office tent will possibly the office space per person will enlarge because we do not want everyone to sit in large groups together. We will have more small groups. We will need the office place to be more sociable, more something that's valuable to travel to. And as you can see, cities will have to be more green, will have to be more walkable, will quiet, bikeable. This is what has been happening this summer. Farms will have to be multi-story to be urban, of course, farmland. And as you see, uh, interesting thoughts by Foster. And I do agree, we will not have a total change of our society. As we noticed in summer, as soon as restrictions were easened, everybody went into the old again. And when this winter, this terrible winter is over, I'm very sure everybody will travel like hell and everybody will go and make and say, I have been missing this for one and a half years. I will go to New Zealand tomorrow and so on. So I'm not sure this is a sustainable change of our behavior. Now, um, as we talked about these trends one slide ago by that Foster was talking about, uh, we can probably possibly apply these to our Western Northern cities, but what about the real interesting mega agglomerations in the global South? Will they be able to go on and uh, change and transform their cities? As you all know, this is um, the Mercator projection, which in the West we have been using and still use in our school atlas and everywhere. The Mercator projection is interesting as, the, of course, the equator is not at the center, but as you see here, one third from below, making countries below the equator smaller, like Australia, um, Brazil, and so on, and countries north of the equator, like Japan and Germany, for example, bigger. Um, and the, thing is, the other thing is, our society, European and Japanese society, are the aging societies in the world. This is the median age. And we are, we are down there up on top with Germany 47. And we will continue to be older, meaning very soon the median age of our society is more than 50 which does not make for a society that will be able to develop innovative things. And um, as you can see here, um, this is the, the age, how it has been developing. And and your country and Europe, we are the old ones, as you can see, hitting the 40s in the year 2000. And where we are now, we will soon hit the 50s as the average age, um, while other parts of the world 
are far younger and this is not a very optimistic outlook. And as you see here in the year 2060, which of course is far away from today and maybe the future will not turn out this way, but China, as you see, is the biggest blue country, meaning the Chinese will have a very difficult future ahead of them. Japan too, and Europe, as because a society where the average age is 50 is not a society that brings forward innovative impulses. Rather, it will be a society where the major majority of the voters will be below 50, uh, uh, no, older than 50. Meaning, if the politicians want to win the election, they will go after the majority of the voters. This means we, as older people, will be the majority of the voters and we will vote for more quietness, please. Um, less parties, uh, none of this digital stuff and so on. We will want to go on in our usual ways and the politicians will always go after the majority of the voters, which is the older people. And as you see here, is, this is not long ago, 1950, we were two and a half million, two and a half billion people. And you see where Japan is lying in these uh, uh, colors in blue in the middle and Germany green in the middle. And then as you see, year 2000, year 2050, year 2100, where is Japan now? When the world maybe will be 11 billion people, Japan is a very small country with, of course, not so much influence as China or India. And where is Europe? Green, where is Germany? You know, where is the US? What is this Nigeria? How come they are one of the biggest countries? So if you look at these things from where we are now, here, between here and there, certain places in the world, like Africa and Orange, will have so many people that they will have a major voice. They will have a major influence. They will have major problems. Um, China will not be the biggest country anymore, but India, will India be the possible leading country of Asia? Um, as you see, this is looking at how our populations in the world will increase in Africa, Sub-Sahara and Iraq and how populations will decrease in Eastern Europe and China and Japan, Thailand. Population numbers will always go with political influence. And this is only what's coming out of the demographics. These are supposed to be the largest cities in the world in the future. Many of them we don't even know today. I mean, who has been to Blantyre City, Li Longwe, Lusaka? These are supposed to be the biggest cities of the world with Lagos in leading with 88 million people. So where is the big super large agglomerations in uh, US in East Asia beside Manila and Jakarta? Now, this is a possible future. These could be the biggest cities and they will determine where things are going. The Americans call this the overstretched 100 million city. Is this an urbanization that is out of control? Will these cities still be civitas? Will, will anybody be able to control them? How about the civility, the collective action and the responsibility towards others? How does this work in such places? This is Mexico City um, taken seven years ago. I was there two years ago. It is a strange place because it has only high rises on this avenue and in between and around it, it's basically four stories were very wonderful buildings with lots of trees, um, a nice city down there on the ground, quite a wonderful place. You would not think about that. But 
is this something that we can control? This is the question. And I will stop with my presentation at this point. I'm 25 minutes with my time. And um, so we do have a little bit to talk. Thank you very much.